I am pleased to introduce you to our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Tor Wager. Uh, Dr. Wager is a Diana L. Taylor uh, Distinguished Professor in Neuroscience at uh, Dartmouth uh, College. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Michigan in Cognitive Psychology in 2003 and served as an, an assistant and associate professor at uh, Columbia University and as associate and full professor at the University of Co uh, Colorado Boulder. Uh, since 2004, he has directed the Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience Laboratory, a research lab devoted to work on, on the neurophysiology of affective processes, which uh, include uh, pain, emotion, stress, and empathy, and how they are shaped by cognitive and social influences. Uh, Dr. Wager and his lab are also dedicated to developing analysis methods for functional neuroimaging and uh, sharing ideas, tools, and scientific data with the scientific community and public. Uh, the title of this presentation for this morning is a Divergent Roles uh, for Ancillar Subregions in Pain, Emotion, and Cognition. So uh, welcome, Dr. Wager, and you can uh, do your presentation. Terrific. Thank you very much and really appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak to you today. And uh, this conference so far has really been fabulous. Um, and let me know if you, if you can hear me okay. <laughs> and you can see the slides. Yeah, that's good. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So this, uh, you know, thinking about this talk and preparing it has gotten me uh, off on an, in an interesting new direction because we've spent the last decade or so uh, working with multivariate patterns that are distributed across the brain and focusing less frankly on the role of any one particular region or set of regions. And so this has uh, you know, challenged me to take a new look at, um, at some of the data we have, which um, has gotten me quite excited actually. But I'm gonna start with a note on neural architecture. So I'm interested in the neural architecture of affect and motivation. And, and why am I interested in that and what is that? Well, I think in many fields, we know what the units of analysis are. Um, in genetics, arguably. And um, here in the brain science, we don't really know yet what the units of analysis are when it comes to the brain and when it comes to uh, affective and motivational processes. So understanding the units can help give us some measurements, measures of, for, for specific mechanisms and stages, uh, um, as I'll explain in a moment. And that can help us understand how interventions work and how to improve them. So in my lab, we've been quite interested in psychosocial interventions and manipulations that can influence pain and other feelings and symptoms. And they include things like uh, supportive care and touch. If you have a, a clinician who's concordant with you, who is similar to you and who you trust, if you are moving together with a person or otherwise in synchrony with them, uh, if uh, somebody has positive expectations of you uh, and if they, uh, if they experience things that, that, um, that might uh, spread to you and you might um, inherit essentially from them and uh, cultural differences and how those things play out. And we've, we've been working on all these things in terms of pain control. Um, but the real questions that I'm persistently interested in are how do they work? Uh, and it could be even something like getting a, a placebo a, a treatment, which is no treatment at all, except it works by the, uh, the thoughts and appraisals and expectations of the the treated person. So with this and any, uh, any of these other interventions, we'd like to know, do they have early nociceptive effects if they're treatments for pain? Um, or do they affect late decision-making and reporting stages? Are there different effects for different interventions or interventions that are done different ways or in different contexts? And that's uh, a long-term endeavor. And I think it has a lot to do with the insula, as I'll tell you in a second. Um, <clears throat> but I think our concepts, our affective concepts, haven't um, given us a, a, a terrific roadmap for what the affective units of analysis are. So if you think about going way back to Jeremy Bentham, the idea of pain and pleasure, the idea of utility theory places pain and pleasure on a continuum. And many different kinds of pains and, and pleasures, so to speak, are all interchangeable. They're integrated into one common representation of utility or value. So maybe for any given study or population or intervention, it doesn't matter which kind you um, study. The idea of core affect in psychology has a similar roots. So uh, many different kinds of affective manipulations are uh, mapped into the space of valence, pleasant, unpleasant, and um, activation, de deactivation, or arousal. And so again, many, maybe all these different types of affective events are, are interchangeable. On the other hand, the 
emerging literature on sensory systems has identified many uh, uh, senses with, with specific pathways. If you look at the, the touch senses over here, I've drawn out you know, something like about you know, 10, 10 or more different kinds of, um, of tactile and touch senses. And uh, what recent neuroscience has shown us is that they are mediated by uh, separable families of, of transducers that we have inherited from our ancient ancestors. Uh, and they ascend into the brain with labeled lines, and they are often quite distinct uh, in the spinal cord and even after that. And so, um, for example, if you're uh, a rodent and you are of one particular strain or another, which you see here on this axis, and you're, you know, the, the type of um, sensitivity you have to, let's say, heat pain on the top here is quite different than the type of sensitivity you have to a mechanical uh, painful stimulus on the bottom. In fact, there's almost no relationship. And this is work from Jeff Mogul's lab uh, from back some time. So maybe different types of pain and affect are not interchangeable and we need to differentiate. And this is what I mean by the units of analysis. So you can imagine different types of architectures. You can imagine one where there's a common value representation. So multiple types of somatosensory events, heat and pressure, that's a rock, and visceral pain, uh, also vicarious pain. If you see here in the bottom left, this is a, oh, it makes my stomach uh, a turn, you know, uh, might activate sort of the same um, representation in the, the brain and mind. Um, social pain of rejection. And um, if it's just everything bad, maybe other types of aversive events, you know, uh, uh, this dirty toilet or math, I don't like math. And from this common representation of value comes various kinds of decision-making uh, awareness and then communication and self-report and, and learning effects and so on. Um, there might be a common representation for pain affect where all these types of somatosensory um, things come together in a common representation, as well as other kinds of psychological pains, um, but not other kinds of, of immersive or emotional events. And that's certainly been the basis of um, theorizing over the, the past years, where in the anterior insula, for example, and cingulate, there's been proposed to be a, a common representation for, um, for pain, uh, and that stretches across observed pain or vicarious pain, you see here on the top from Tiny Singer's work, and uh, social pain of rejection, as you see here from Naomi Eisenberger's work on the bottom. But there are other architectures as well. Um, one could imagine that there's a common representation for nociceptive pain across different types, and different representations for vicarious pain and social pain and that these things compete essentially at the late stage, at the decision-making stage and motor response stage, uh, rather than, um, than some sort of earlier meaningful common representation. And finally, there might be separate representations all the way up into the cortex, uh, in, including the insula, uh, with competition again at their, the, the late stages of, of processing. And I wanted to illustrate this to show you that this is really a hard problem. I don't think we have it figured out. Uh, and that's what we've been working on. I think the idea of insular subdivisions, which is the next part of the talk, um, <clears throat> is really an important one for helping to understand uh, how to break these uh, various processes up into to stages. So there are, are now many um, wonderful ways of breaking up the insula into uh, subregions. They can be based on anatomy, like you see here in gyri, uh, based on um, multimodal connectivity in this glasser atlas based on co-activation with neurosynth, um, based on uh, resting state ICA networks um, and other, other kinds of clustering based on uh, connectivity as well. Um, those are the brain netome and the Shen atlases. Um, and by the way, all of these are available to, to download in our core tools and um, some of the authors who have published these things have, have shared them with us. And so it's easy to, to recreate this kind of diagram uh, and apply those as regions of interest. Uh, but again, what are the units of analysis exactly? I'm just going to explore this. They could be the gross anatomical region, as all these partial regions suggest. It might be multivoxel patterns within those regions that, that uh, convey particular more uh, subtle information. Or it might be the community that, um, that each of these regions participates in that really defines the function. Uh, as we know that the insular, insular connectivity changes. And, and with pain, for example, you integrate multiple systems into a, a larger units. Um, so the resting state networks don't uh, quite apply. 
Um, and when we think about insular subdivisions, this kind of takes me way back to some really early work um, that I did. Uh, and this is a, a parcellation of the insular based on Meslum and Muthsen's work inside of architecture and looking at different uh, varieties of, of uh, you know, connectivity with different areas um, before the advent of modern connectomics. But it was a, you know, a pretty interesting and I think useful subdivision into four parts on each side, um, a posterior part in uh, our green here. And this is a, an early meta-analysis across hand-coded studies um, where this posterior insula responds um, as a real grouping for, for pain. And see, you can see pain activates all these divisions. Um, there's a mid-insula, which is activated by pain and other emotional tasks, and the anterior insula, the dorsal and ventral anterior insula where the ventral part is predominantly activated by emotion, uh, emotion related studies that are not pain. Uh, and the, the dorsal part in yellow is activated predominantly by uh, uh, studies of attention shifting and working memory. So so-called executive functions or cognitive control. And the idea that we had from this early work, uh, which I think carries some utility. So I'm gonna bring it forward now is that um, there is a, a, a pathway in the insula that connects these early sensory representations. So in the, the green area would be um, specific for nociceptive pain, and it would project forward into the anterior insula, which is really not so much about the sensation anymore, um, but it's actually about communicating with the, the cortex, the lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, to um, in, uh, shape goals, the formation of goals, and guide motivated action. Uh, and so that's there's a there's a, the proposal that there's a separate um, sensory pathway for nociception and pain in you know from the posterior insula forward and then on into the cortex and a different one for other types of appetitive motivation and for example um, receiving different inputs from the nucleus tractus solitarius here into the ventral uh, insula which might be important for appetitive motivation uh, in the ventral stream as we heard um, beautifully yesterday from Alain. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this early hand-coded meta-analytic work uh, suggests that there is um, quite a bit of specificity in the posterior insula, including here S2 and posterior insula, for, uh, for pain. And you can see um, from a series of meta-analytic databases, there's this emotion, this is cognitive inhibition, a form of cognitive control, long-term memory, pain, shifting attention, and, and working memory. We can calculate the positive predictive value for um, if, if uh, we activate this, these areas that you see here in, in S2 and posterior insula, what's the probability that it's a pain task instead of something else? And here the positive predictive value is uh, nearly 90%. Uh, but the anterior insula, of course, is, is not specific. Um, and neither is the dorsal anterior cingulate. And these are often uh, co-activated and connected. So you can see it responds broadly across all of these different manipulations. Uh, and um, I want to spend a little bit of time on this because I think this really holds water in terms of uh, in terms of a concept that we can start to test with interventions. That's where I'm heading later. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about a very influential theory that Bud Craig put forward, which is essentially that the posterior insula here that you see here is um, is really about thermosensory or other perhaps other somatic sensory um, perceptions. And it's the anterior insula that tracks the reported experience, the pain. And from that, he came up with this, this uh, overarching theory that the anterior insula is important for human awareness. And so you see all these different uh, um, studies here that he's collected that, that seem to activate the anterior insula to some approximation. Uh, and and he, his claim is, is that this is what mediates uh, the subjective awareness of, of pain, but also other experiences. And I wanted to argue uh, against this idea, uh, as, as nice as it is in many respects. Um, so this is his Nature Neuroscience paper from 2000 with, with 10 people. And you, you can see this sort of level of approximation. But um, in the intervening years, we can do a somewhat better. So this is a larger sample uh, where we've taken um, 280 people across seven independent studies. And we've uh, developed a multivariate model that predicts pain on individual trials. And that's what you see here on the left. And so this is the map that you see here. Yellow is more pain, uh, pr predicted pain. Blue is less predicted pain. And then we tested it on an independent data on pain and sound. And um, the multivariate model you can see here predicts uh, pain on individual trials um, quite well overall. 
uh, including in independent data. But I'm going to focus here on this right part, which is the univariate model is just testing region by region and voxel by voxel of what predicts pain intensity on a given trial controlling for the temperature. And you can see the map right here. And I want to point out, this map does not look like Bud Craig's map. In fact, the dorsal posterior insula here and S2 are sort of quite discrete um, clusters, and they correlate with reported pain or, or awareness uh, as strongly as any other region in the brain, um, more or less. And they correlate more strongly than anterior insula, which doesn't even really show up here at all. So these areas that are identified as important for emotion and executive function are in fact not tracking the momentary experience of pain. So I think of this as a, a revision of that story that, um, that tells makes sort of an important point. And the point is that these representations are more separate than we thought. It does, it's not as though everything converges on the dorsal anterior insula, and the mid insula is more important. Another view we can take is from uh, neurosynth.org, which came up yesterday as well. Um, and this is a database that, that Talia Arconi built um, some years ago now while well, he was in the lab and he um, collected coordinates from, now there's over 14,000 neuroimaging studies, as well as the words and the topics used in all of those studies. And so one can um, do a, a term-based search for various kinds of terms. And this is a map of essentially what people are talking about when they, in the paper, when they, they find you know, the, uh, these, these types of maps. Um, and you can enter maps in and do a, a decoding analysis and say, what are the top terms associated with this? Um, of uh, any particular map. So Luke Chang uh, published a paper a few years ago that looks at um, insula subdivisions. And what he did is use that neuroscience database and cluster um, the insular voxels based on the co-activation with other systems. And he ended up with a, a three uh, region parcellation. So it's fairly coarse, but it does have the basic ingredients that map on uh, to this, this concept that I was talking about before. Um, and um, I think this also maps on really quite well to the, to the uh, beautiful work on, on stimulation uh, that we heard from yesterday as well from, from Philippe, that the posterior insula, uh, it, it um, tracks things that are associated with pain, somatosensory and sensory motor uh, mainly, and there's some confusion with auditory uh, areas here. Uh, and the dorsal posterior insula, executive function, switching, inhibition, processing, conflict, feedback, uh, and the ventral anterior insula, olfaction, anxiety, face, gustation, emotion. So it's, it's quite a nice division. He also looked at um, connectivity. So both resting state connectivity that you see here on the left and co-activation in the Neurosense database that you see here on the right. And uh, these tell a broadly similar story. I, I would say these, these maps um, could, you know, could be further refined today, but, uh, but the idea is that the posterior insula communicates with this sensory motor system that you see here. Uh, and the paracentral lobule and uh, lateral somatosensory uh, areas and so forth. Whereas um, let's say the, the emotion related map or the ventral anterior insula co-activates with the amygdala, the orbital frontal cortex uh, and basal forebrain and, and um, um, other areas. And here's a, here's a map here of what their associates are too, anxiety, emotion, and face, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and that was largely true. And of course the, the uh, dorsal anterior insula is most connected to um, lateral frontal parietal areas that are involved in cognitive control. And I'd like to show you a little bit about the basic ganglia because this also came up yesterday that we can integrate the basal ganglia in the circuit. So this is a slightly later version of the database uh, across nearly 6,000 studies. And Wolfgang Pauli took these and looked at co-activation across studies. And what he did was he parcelated the basal ganglia based on co-activation with the cortex, um, much as, as Luke did earlier. And he ends up with a multi-resolution clustering so that there are different um, um, topics that are associated with each uh, cluster. And so you can see some of these topics here and I'll, I'll go over them in a second. But he ended up you know, with uh, five different zones, um, each one associated with a different cortical network. And you can see those here. And of course, there's, there's, that's a little bit arbitrary. So there's also you know, a 17 cluster solution and, and other resolutions as well. But, but five was a, a, a pretty reasonable um, subdivision for functional imaging data. And these, um, you know, this gives you a slightly different uh, um, position than early work by, for example, Peter Strick, um, uh, Alexander and Strick with this, this classic idea of 
different kinds of motor um, maps that go through the basal ganglia, so motor, ocular motor, um, and then the various prefrontal and, and cingulate loops. And it really maps in some of the human concepts that we uh, care about. So in fact, from the patterns of um, topics associated with these different maps, we group them into several um, groups, five groups. So um, the, the anterior one is about the immediate stimulus value and then action value and, and motivation updating. Uh, go, and so I'm moving from front to back. Executive function and, and control of action policies uh, is the third one. And as we're moving back again, um, social and language function and action implementation. So there's lots of loading on things like uh, uh, words and pseudo words and so forth. And then um, finally, in the back, we're, we're back in the, the sensory domain, so stable sensory motor um, biases in the posterior part of the striata. And that matters for us here for two reasons. One is that we can also uh, look at the associations with the insula. And what Wolfie did was he looked, he actually developed a statistical technique that identified the cortical voxels that are more strongly connected with any one striatal cluster than any other, uh, with each striatal cluster than any other cluster. So this is a map where, um, say, these blue areas here in the ventral anterior insula are um, more connected with this blue striatal zone in the anterior putamen than any other part of the striatum, and so forth for the other clusters. And you can see that there's a, a topography in the, um, in the insula as well, uh, going from anterior to uh, posterior. And so roughly from anterior to posterior, uh, the idea is that there's this, you know, stimulus value, action value, executive, and then social language is sort of in, in the middle, um, executive functions in the middle too, and then finally the stable sensory motor biases in the posterior part. So that's another way of thinking about the organization of, of the insula. And I think that's an interesting concept because um, it has a sense of how uh, things are consolidated over time. So if we Think about the flow of information and taking a page from um, Suzanne Haber's work. This is, uh, uh, and Brian Newton and, and Suzanne have written about this, and as well as other work like uh, from um, Kim and Hikasaka. There's this idea that in these more anterior circuits, that's where things start. That's where the, the value and motivation is, is computed. And there's this iterative series of spirals that, that will, um, yeah, that will go from this very fast and flexible and context dependent. Uh, representation to shaping of, of motivation and of, of then action policy and then action implementation. Um, and we go from a system in the, the anterior parts of the, the cortex, including the anterior insula, that are for, for very fast and flexible um, determination of current goals to uh, very stable, slow context insensitive representations that then might be very difficult to affect with interventions. <laughs> uh, so the, the former might be very modifiable in the second and the latter might be not very modifiable by, by interventions. Um, <clears throat> so that leads me to the third part on multivariate patterns. And um, we've moved to a lot of pattern-based analysis over the last years because any voxel or any region is unlikely to be very functionally specific. Uh, so a voxel contains a, approximately five and a half million neurons and uh, multiple blood vessels, and these neurons do different things. So um, this is one example of, of from, from Greg Corder and Greg Scherer, where they looked at populations of cells in the amygdala, and as in many other areas, they can identify, um, uh, well, though, actually this was special in this study because they, they have all these different conditions, but, but like in, in many areas, there are mixed populations. But here, what they can do is identify a nociceptive ensemble, and they're looking at not just heat, not just cold, pinprick, um, and they are looking at its relationship with touch, with sucrose, uh, and other kinds of aversive um, uh, conditions like, like a shock. And what they identify is this nociceptive ensemble that has neurons in common. There's overlap between the nociceptive and other kinds of aver aversive um, processing processes. But when they activate uh, the nociceptive ensemble optogenetically, then that produces pain-specific behavior. So among all these neurons, there's a pattern that's identifiable in a population um, that, uh, that, that is specific to um, nociception and, and pain. And that's where we'd like to get to with functional imaging. So the patterns uh, are going to get us a little bit closer to that, that goal. Uh, and it makes us think maybe you know, which regions you activate is not the operating principle, even which neurons, but 
the population uh, that they communicate with and, and the community that they're a part of. And all of these papers make this point in various ways. Um, okay, so pattern similarity can be more functionally specific. Going back to the insula, the problem with this posterior insula story is that we published an earlier paper and others have done similar work by like Christian Kiesers that, that, uh, that identifies a posterior insula uh, activation here for um, romantic rejection, looking at the person who rejected you in love. And so you can see this common activation. Now, does that mean that rejection is like pain? Well, when we looked more carefully using multivariate analyses, what we found is that there are actually different patterns. And I'm just going to focus here on the posterior insula and on, on S2. And what you can see is the patterns that actually code for the intensity of pain or the intensity of rejection uh, in, in this case um, are quite distinct. In fact, they're not related. So essentially, there are different subpopulations uh, or different local regions in a way that we didn't appreciate before. Another issue with multivariate patterns that has, has gotten me really thinking in, in about how to integrate this with this localist you know, view is that when we look at what's required in the brain to predict pain or predict other uh, kinds of affective conditions, what we often find is that we need activity from multiple systems working together. There's no one region of the brain. And actually, you can see that here. And this is a pain prediction um, uh, endeavor here. And you can see that the, the, the best single region is not very predictive of, of pain. And any single resting state network is not that predictive. And when we get to, up to using you know, large areas of the brain across systems, it becomes predictive. Um, so there is this um, natural, and this is from Bogdan Petrie, has done a very careful um, analysis of this across multiple studies predicting pain as well. And the bottom line is you really need these, to, these systems working together to make a prediction. So there's this natural tension between uh, a local area, like what's the posterior insula doing? And this broader, uh, 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 okay, well, to measure pain, we need that plus a number of other elements. Uh, and if we, so, so um, there is evidence though that we can identify both common and distinct representations for, for pain affect. Um, and so I'll just go through this quickly. This is a study of, um, of somatic pain and vicarious pain across different uh, body sites, arm and foot at different intensities. Uh, and so we can look at the overlap and activation. We can look at the pattern similarity and we can look at the somatotopy. And we can see that they're approximately matched on the ratings of aversiveness here, uh, which is also another important consideration. And if we look at the whole brain level, we can identify a pattern, which we call the neurologic pain signature, and we validated it in various ways, which is a different, different talk, but it responds only to um, the heat pain, uh, and it tracks the intensity and pain reports, but it doesn't respond to observed pain or vicarious pain. Uh, and we can identify a vicarious pain signature that has the opposite property. It tracks the intensity and correlates with the, the, the reported aversion for vicarious pain that you see here in purple, but doesn't respond at all to, um, to self pain or heat pain. Uh, and that pattern of separate modifiability lets us know that they're dissociable at the whole brain pattern level. But now if I turn back to the insula, what have we learned about, about the insula from this? Well, um, the insula has a known somatotopy, again, in the posterior insula for upper and lower limb. And we see that with, with somatic pain but we don't see that somatotopy at all with um, vicarious pain. And that's also true of the uh, lateral sensory motor cortex. Um, okay, so, we, so there's quite a bit of specificity. On the other hand, uh, Feng Zhu recently published a study with a really large attempt to develop a generalizable pattern for um, shared pain affect. And he finds one. So this is you know, a, a pattern that codes for pain affect when you're looking at other people uh, injuring themselves here. So that's observed pain. And when you're looking at pain, facial expressions here. And the patterns that are predictive of those are shared in insula there. Um, uh, and an interesting point here is that this particular pattern representation doesn't respond to other kinds of emotional images, IAPS images. So this isn't tracking general negativity. That's the closest thing we found so far to something that's actually tracking common pain uh, affect. And there's this particular part of the anterior mid insula that you can see down here, then that's, that's uh, tracking that, that shared pain affect representation. Uh, okay, so, um, and it was also associated in neurosynth with painful things and it tracked somatic pain as well. 
So it does seem to be a shared representation. Um, and let's contrast that with another multivariate pattern that's designed to predict guilt-related behavior. So in this, these paradigms, there's two studies, and you judge the number of dots, larger or smaller. And the operative condition in both of them is, is where the participant makes an error and the, uh, another player gets punished for that error. So those are the conditions that can create uh, guilt. Um, and we identified a pattern that responds specifically to these guilt-inducing conditions across among many others. And um, you can see uh, the, the significant parts of that pattern here. And I'm going to focus here on the anterior insula pattern. So now we're in the ventral anterior insula and operculum. So that's actually a different uh, part of, of the insula. And just to see how this pattern performs, uh, you can see this condition here in red on the left is where uh, you make an error and then the other person gets punished. And there's a number of other conditions in these games where they're not the case. Um, that's not the case. So it's, it's quite uh, sensitive and the same pattern generalizes to the new study where in this red bar here, that's again, the critical uh, condition. Um, it doesn't respond, this pattern to, uh, to somatic pain, to actually getting pain. It doesn't respond to vicarious pain. So this seems to be something that's quite different. Uh, and if we put this, these pieces together, I think we have evidence for different patterns for different affective responses in the local, uh, in, in the insula. So, so these are two pain patterns uh, that predict pain intensity. This is one I showed you before, but you can see both posterior and this uh, mid insula, dorsal and ventral aspect. And the SIPS is predicting pain intensity when you control for the stimulus and remove, um, remove all the effects of stimulus intensity. You can see the same pattern uh, similarly. Um, but the pain affect pattern hits uh, essentially part of that, arguably the, the anterior part of the mid insula might be a shared uh, representation. And um, this, uh, the guilt behavior pattern is tracking something that's uh, uh, likely quite different. It's really more ventral anterior insula. So that actually conforms roughly to this, um, this initial uh, concept. Okay, so just to drop now as I wrap up here on understanding interventions. So at the end of the day, we'd like to understand uh, from the brain what's happening with an intervention. And this is really a challenge. We've been studying placebo effects for the last uh, 15 years or, or so. And there are, are patterns of activity decreases during pain with a placebo that you see here in blue and increases that you see in red. And they fall into, uh, the decreases fall into several categories. So it looks like placebo reduces pain in the anterior insula here uh, in the uh, anterior cingulate cortex in the medial thalamus, but um, posterior insula uh, decreases have been um, much less well established. It has, hasn't been very clear. So in this study, uh, final study, which is a, a really wonderful uh, collaboration across many groups, we pulled together 600 um, people's data. We can look at what happens when um, people get pain of multiple types. Uh, and you can see that really the entire insula is activated. I don't think the entire insula predicts pain intensity, uh, but I think there's this very broad scale activation with pain. Um, and we can look at the responses to placebo. And you can see the reductions with the placebo treatment during pain in, in blue here, including parts of the mid insula that I'll show you in a moment. Um, and, and the stratum and others, as you can see right there. Um, so this is what's reduced overall with a placebo treatment. And you can look at, this is another view of that map. And you can see here over on the right, we see both the, the dorsal posterior insula, the putative nociceptive um, uh, areas, and you see this common shared representation for, for pain and affect, may, maybe related to, to pain concepts. Uh, and these are the areas that correlate with placebo analgesia. So all the areas in blue, uh, the larger the decrease in brain, the more pain relief. So that gives us sort of converging picture. And if you look again at the map of the insula, you see both these sort of posterior and mid insula and anterior and, and also more, uh, more anterior uh, areas here. Um, so if we add that to our map, uh, oh yeah, I'll give you this very, very quickly. Um, and we can, we can look at, at, um, at, at thalamic subregions and insula subregions. And the critical question are which of these subregions are really tracking both the effects of placebo and, and the uh, correlations. So this is a complicated graph in one minute, I, I give you that, but you can see all the areas in red here are actually activated during painful stimulation. So most of the insula here and selected regions based on the ventral uh, 
ventral lateral thalamus um, and, and, and midline thalamus. So, so some of the thalamic areas you expect. If you look at what's influenced by placebo, there's this, uh, this mid anterior insula area is quite important. That's here. And then on the right, that's also correlated with, uh, with analgesia. So that's one of the really key areas uh, for, for, for placebo effects. And we see parallel effects in the thalamus on some of these um, uh, sensory areas. It turns out the ventral lateral thalamus also shows effects of placebo, of placebo that are correlated. That's right in, in here, if you can see my cursor. And that is, in fact, in fact, the input nucleus to the dorsal posterior insula. So we can move towards identifying this, this pathway and then establishing that a placebo treatment really can, in some cases at least, or some individuals, um, uh, you know, in, uh, alter activity in that, that pathway. So if we put this into our picture, we see these pain-related uh, patterns here in the, in the posterior insula uh, and, and mid-insula, and we see placebo effects on um, some of those, those same areas. Okay, that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I've talked about the importance of architecture and how we're actually quite far from establishing a, a definitive architecture, how looking at insular subdivisions can be particularly informative, especially in the, the domain of pain, because there do seem to be different uh, subdivisions that have very different properties and how they encode pain versus other affective events. And um, I talked about how we can use multivariate patterns and we can identify both a, a pain specific posterior insula representation and a mid-insula uh, uh, shared representation for pain affect potentially, and how the anterior insula isn't really in, involved in the same way that we uh, that we uh, assume that it would be um, uh, in these early studies. Once we look at larger samples and more precise definition, and finally, I showed you an example where uh, when we have sufficient power, we can start to really um, develop a better map of how placebo effects work and how that might be influencing the pathways that are involved in, in uh, constructing pain from the both ventral posterior thalamus to uh, the posterior insula, as well as more anterior insular subdivisions. Um, so with that, I'm just going to say thank you to my, my lab and my former lab and my collaborators uh, who've been really fabulous and, and many others actually who are not, not shown here. Uh, thanks to our funders and thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.